Hi, everyone. Hello again. Adel Safer. The second chapter. A book revelation is an intrinsic necessity. The subject which is to occupy us this morning, and if it please God also on the next occasion, is the following. The Bible is the Word of God. I wish to dwell more specially today on the Bible as a revelation from God and to consider in my next lecture the human, historical, and progressive aspect of Scripture in relation to Christ and the Spirit of God. A divine revelation embodied in a book is not unworthy of God, and it is according to divine wisdom and love that God, who revealed himself in acts and in words to the fathers by prophets and apostles, should have caused the whole revelation to be committed to writing in order that all future generations might possess it in a form secure, complete, correct, and easy of access. A book revelation is an intrinsic necessity. In no other way could the divine purposes of love have been secured, and as we have already shown, this book has been has made a deep impression upon mankind so that among all the books of the world it stands out preeminent even as Jesus Christ stands out preeminent among all the children of men a few days before his death when Sir Walter Scott was in his library he said to his son-in-law will you read something to me and when asked what book his immediate reply was you need not ask there's only one book a few years ago as a French pastor tells us, there was a meeting of a number of literary and scientific men, some of whom were skeptics and materialists. And in the course of conversation, the question arose, if we were banished to a lonely island, or if we had to suffer imprisonment for a lifetime, what book from among all the books of which human literature consists would be chosen to be our sole companion? And the unanimous answer was, the Bible. Mm. This book, which is in the wonderful providence of God, arose gradually, the art of writing being known. Oops, sorry. The art of writing being known to the children of Israel at least as early as the days of Moses, and which afterwards, through its translation into the Greek language, found its way to all nations is now as ever after having contended against all persecution and opposition a book unique in its vitality in its attractiveness in its interest and in its power greek literature stands out above the literature of all other nations and all agree in acknowledging its brilliancy and power but it does not reach the heart of man for it does not breathe the atmosphere of eternity. It does not reach the deep things of the human soul, whereas Hebrew, a much poorer and barer language, planting itself before the very sanctuary of human consciousness, has taken hold of the hearts and souls of all races and families of the earth. Yet, while dwelling on this and on the peculiar, powerful, an attractive style of scripture. We were, after all, only in the outer court. It is as when standing before a beautiful and glorious cathedral, where, at the very outset, the gates attract our attention and offer to us many interesting points of observation. But the real beauty and glory can only be seen when we pass on, within, or it is like standing before a garden where there is a hedge which does not altogether prevent us from seeing what is beyond. Through the gaps in the hedge you can get glimpses of some of the lovely flowers and perceive the fragrance of others. Yet you cannot really see the beauty of the garden till you enter it and stand within. Yet the attractiveness of the Bible, its unique style, the hold it takes upon the human heart, none of these would have existed if the Bible had been only human. It is because it stands above mankind that it dwells within mankind. And who is he that inhabits the high and holy place and yet dwells in the human heart but God, the Lord? And as God is, so is his word. I shall speak now of Scripture as it is regarded by the friends of Scripture. 
as I reminded you that whilst in regard to Jesus it was acknowledged that no man ever spoke like this man by those that were strangers to his grace there was also an inmost circle of his disciples who believed and were sure that he was the Son of God so it is in regard to the scriptures the scriptures might say to those who persecute them many good works have I done among you for which of these good works do you persecute me and the answer of men would be for a good work we persecute thee, thee not but because thou being a book like other books claimest to be a divine book but the testimony of the intimate friends of the Bible is that scripture is the word of God it may be said that the testimony of friends is not of decisive value and yet after all who but a friend can witness effectively the witness of enemies is negative and so it was in the case of Jesus Judas said I have shed innocent blood Pilate said I find no fault in him the Pharisees were unable to bring any accusation against him or to convince him of sin but it was only the apostles who were able to testify of the person of Jesus and remarkable it is that the disciple who was most intimately acquainted with the humanity of our blessed Savior he who lent on the bosom of Jesus was the disciple who was most emphatically who most emphatically testified that they had beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Mm. And the testimony of the friends of the Bible is a gr of great importance when we remember this, that the friends of the Bible were not born friends of the Bible, were once strangers to the Word and enemies of the Word, but that there was given to them light from above and a conviction which nothing in this world can shake. Another peculiarity about the friends of the Bible is this, that every one of them is an independent witness. Every one of them can say, like the men of Samaria, now we believe the Bible, not because we have been so taught from our infancy, but because of the testimony of the church and its ministers, but because we have seen it ourselves and heard its voice and are convinced that it is the Word of God. For that light which shines into every one that believes is the same light which shone in those who knew him, and now shines in the original testimony of those who bore witness unto him, that we may believe that this is indeed the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we may have life through his name. Thus, when the whole world acknowledges the peculiarity of the book, and when we know the reason for that peculiarity, we contrast it with all other books. All other books are ephemeral, simply pamphlets which come and go. This is for all ages. Others address themselves to a limited sphere of mankind, whether of race or of learning or of class. This speaks to all mankind. Others in the course of centuries are exhausted and all that is valuable in them is absorbed. This book is inexhaustible. The mine is deep and the more we search the more are there brought out treasures of gold and silver from its hidden depths. Other books contain errors which have to be refuted and implications which have to be supplemented. This, oh, imperfections. I don't know if I said imperfections. And imperfections with have to, which have to be supplemented. This book is like gold tried in the fire. And not merely is it free from error, but it contains in itself a rectifying power, which is able to cope with every error and heresy as it arises in the history of mankind and this because it is God's book. <coughs> Saffer lived in the era when it was assumed that conservative, the conservative position of the Bible was that it was free from error. Now there are conservatives today who don't believe that is a necessary uh, attribute of the book itself, but that's not doesn't affect his basic argument that this book is unlike any other in that it is it breathes something that yeah. other books don't breathe including the classics of Greek literature I hadn't really thought about that yeah so and penetrates all all peoples yeah 
he's made mm -hmm. the point that Greek literature, the Greek language itself, serves the purpose of God in the New Testament, of course, but the, the majesty of the Greek language doesn't, doesn't confer divinity to modern man. It, mm -hmm. It's only for a very specialized number, whereas this book, written in Greek as well, common Greek at that, mm. has transcended all national boundaries mm. and boundaries of time. Mm. Put a link into Griffith Thomas's, the first of the series we did from a playlist that I'll also link, which is, is the, is the Bible God's revelation? And that playlist of about 19 videos as well.